you bow with me? Father, we love you so much, and we just thank you for the, uh, the music, the, uh, the prayer, the, um, just uh, 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 the sharing, the testimony, Father, the ministry that you've called uh, your brother to, Father, and also this congregation. We ask that you continue to be with us as we continue to worship at this with the opening of God's word. It is in the precious blood I pray. Amen. Thank you, sir, for that. Um, that is, if, brothers and sisters, if you can find the thing that you love, and that's how God created you. He created you to a specific love. I'm looking over here at our, at our actresses and actresses, and you can, and you can, uh, <laughs> actor, yeah. They are, there are more, they're, they're actors. We're not going to pick on you. But if you can find a way to take the thing that you love and apply it to your ministry, uh, you'll never really work a day in ministry in your life. And it's very true. I don't know if you know this about me, but I actually had, um, uh, before I came to Christ, uh, fishing was my love. I mean, I read books on fishing. Uh, I went to uh, uh, Parkland College to bring in bass pros, and they would teach a class, and you'd go there and listen to the pros. I was there. Were you? Yeah, it was 96, so I was in that class. It was, I mean, I was just fascinated. I was I'm very good. If you think fishing is boring, that's because you stink. Uh, seriously, because if, if you know how to, if you know and you study and you read, you go out, I don't care what time of year it is, you'll catch some fish. Uh, we'd go out with ice on the water. And, of course, I was very comedic in, back in the day, not as I am now, but I'd get on the edge of the boat and scream the whole time, iceberg right ahead! But... <laughs> Just because that was it. I fished on Sundays, though. I did. That was my big fishing day, was Sundays. And um, um, lo and behold, I'm not going to go into the story of how I accepted Christ, but as I, as I accepted Christ and I started making sure I was on services on Sunday, and then there's like, hey, you got to go to Sunday school, too. I was like, I see how this works. You're getting me in just a little bit at a time. But as I, uh, as I really focused on um, God, I felt that my call... Um, really was going to limit the amount of time that I spent on recreation. And if you know me today, uh, although I, I'm sure I could go out there and drop a lure, you know, get my bait caster out there and drop a lure where I need to drop it, uh, I don't do it so much because that, that passage that, that he uh, alluded to, uh, leave your poles and I'm going to make you fishers of men, truly does apply to my life. So, but that's, that's just been my call. Still love the, sp love the sport, and it is my hope that if I ever retire, and I don't know if I will, just who I am, uh, I'd love to go retire in North Carolina where it's 25% wetlands, and you literally could fish a quarter of the state. Just boom. Love it so much. Um, today we're going to be in John uh, 21. You can go there. You can mark it, if you will. I am, I'm going to tell you something real quick. I'm very proud of my son, Gabriel, because... Uh, Kyle, I, I'm going to tell on you, I got people all over the town coming to me and telling me how much of a wonderful young man you are. You have a very, you have um, uh, a strong heart. You care for people. I know, I know, Andrew, you're the evil one. So it's just look and nod. But successful. yeah, you're going to be sick. <laughs> But, but Kyle has, he has a heart for, for people, and that is something that not all my children have. Uh, <laughs> Andrew and Connor are more um, on the evil side, and <laughs> in, in a good way, a good evil. You've accepted Christ, hopefully Connor will, and, uh, and the world will be better for it. But Gabriel's a lot like Kyle. Do you know that? Have you ever seen, when you drop Gabriel off at the... At, the, um, at school, he goes up to the crossing guard and hugs her. And, and he's got a hug for every, to the superintendent, it's like, you need a hug. And, and, and he's a very loving child. Well, I'm okay with that. I am, I'm okay. If you know me, I'm not as loving maybe as a pastor should be. Sometimes I'm just a little bit on the harder side. So when, 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 when you're a little bit too over loving, you know, I'm just kind of like, you're going to be a man, right? So, uh, I mean, I'm just saying, you don't kill things every now and then. I'm, I'm proud that you've joined what you would regard as the military. I'm absolutely okay with that. Um, your choice of the military, still, it, it suits who you are. Uh, Air Force. <laughs> it seemed, okay, I get it. Uh, Gabriel, I'm wondering, I'm like, he going to be like a man, man, right? I mean, he can hug people, but be a man. So the other day, he got a magnifying glass. And I'm like, 
all right, we'll see what he does with it. Because there's a good way to use a magnifying glass. There's a proper way. You know the proper way is? Get a bug and then look at it and you can see it, you know, all of the intricates of, of the bug. You can see it. But then there's an evil way. What's the evil, what's the evil way? You burn stuff with it. You take it and you make it a laser beam. You're like, die. Die. And the ants keep moving. You're like, die. Die. Well, Gabe used it in, in the way I think it was be- you know, he Die. Die. Can I have a hug? Die. Die. Boy's going to be a man. He'll hug you, but then he's going to kill you. I was like, I'm okay with that. I'm all right. As, as long as he's still got that, you know, th- that manness about him. I, I like that. But I was, <laughs> I was looking at him, and I was, you know, I was proud of him, proud of him, and then worried, you know, because even though he's killing things, you still worry. You're like, is he going to do that to me? So, <laughs> when I was a kid, we did that. That was the thing. You put your hand out. Nate, I know you did this, didn't you? You get a magnifying glass to your friend. And, and when they weren't looking, you just put it on them. Just, ow, that hurts. But we would do it where you'd put your hand out, you'd put that over there, and like, I ain't moving. I ain't moving. I ain't. And whoever didn't move, the longest was the winner. Uh, in real world, you're actually the loser. But uh, <laughs> we did that with fire ants, too. You take, in, when I was in North Carolina in the, in the military, you'd find a fire ant hill, and you'd stick that stick in there, and you'd hold it. I ain't moving. If you've ever done that, those things will cover that stick and they'll just eat you and they'll bite you alive. So whoever held the longest was the winner or the loser, depending on how you look at that. But I was looking at Gabriel and I was thinking of a, a, a particular gift that God gives us um, and how if it's used in the right way, uh, it is very beneficial to us as believers. But if we use it in the wrong way, uh, it, it, it can be somewhat of a curse. And um, it's so like a magnifying glass. It's our ability to judge. It's our ability to judge. Now, if you're not in Christ that much, and most uh, you all are are in Christ, but if you're not in Christ, that's, that's one of those verses that the entire world seems to know, right? Do not judge one another. Um... I'd be surprised how many times it's used upon me when I make particular statements that says I shouldn't judge. But I think judging stuff is a good thing. It is a good thing. Before we begin services today, uh, I think it was Greg and Randy and I, we were sitting around discussing false teachers. I think in the world that we live in today, having the ability to discern who is a good teacher and who is a wrong teacher is a must. It is a must, especially because generally the, 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 the wrong teachers, the bad teachers, look so much like the good teachers, you better be able to tell the difference. There are people who want to rule over you. There are people who want to control you. And sometimes they have a pastor in front of their name. You've got to be able to tell, is this a bozo who I need to run away from as fast as possible? Or is this somebody that I need to, you know, maybe, okay, he's got God's word, he's preaching, he's teaching it. You've got to be able to do that. But in everyday life, you've got to know how to judge. I was reading something. I was an article in the New York Times today. I read the New York Times in case anybody ever asked me. Do you read the New York Times? I said, yes, I do. Oh, you're very sophisticated. Thank you. I was reading it, and it was about this woman who, who had an abortion. If, you know what? Mercy and grace on, on women that have. Uh, and, and my heart breaks for you because you've gone through stuff that just, I, I, I mean, you know more than anyone what you've gone through. But there was a woman in New York Times talking about how nice it was to have an abortion without the, the clinic being bombed. And I don't think you should bomb clinics. I'm not saying that. And she said, how nice it was not to be protested against. And I don't think we should use terrorist attacks or terrorist um, ways to try to get people to, 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 uh, to, to not have one. She says, how nice it was not to be able to see a picture of that baby so that she could go in there and just not have this kid that she didn't want. 
And then later in life, she's reflecting on, on, on how this child, uh, that she looks over at the, the seat next to her in this empty seat and how, how she doesn't have a child that she's, she's driving around. If she had had that child, it would have been a child asking her for this and that. And I remember reading this and saying, Do you, this is so wrong, how, how you talk about the murder of somebody and how a person doesn't exist because of your choice, and it was nothing more than having a cyst removed. That's sad. Don't you have the ability to tell what is right and what's wrong? We have that ability as Christians. We can look at things and say, this is wrong. This we shall not do. We shouldn't do this. We shall do this. If you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, you, don't, you sin. You ought to know the good that you ought to do. It says in the Bible, and, and this is in, um, in Psalm 1-6, it says, For the, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We need to be able to judge what is right and what is wrong. What is wrong will lead you, even if you are saved, it will still lead you to a very self-destructive life that ends in a lot of tears, ending with the pigs, eating a bad meal. You know the Bible, if, or if you know the Bible, you know what I'm referring to. The way of the righteous, though, even if you make the hard decisions, are still the ones that prosper right there. So, yes, you can be, you need to be, have the ability to judge. But judgment can also be a distractor. If you're in John 21, let me give you a synopsis, quick synopsis of the text I'm about to read. After Jesus had been crucified... After Jesus had rose from the dead, after Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, after Jesus had probably ascended to the Father uh, again, tells Mary, don't touch me, I've not yet ascended to the Father, and then later on uh, the disciples were allowed to touch him. So he's, he's there, and Peter and the disciples returned back to their way of life, which was what? Fishing. Not like that, though. They were more business, commercial fishermen. But they returned to their way of life. Well, Jesus shows up. And has a little conversation with Peter. Remember the conversation? He asked Peter three questions. They're all pretty much the same. What were they? <laughs> Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Now the word for love is different in each one, and I'm not going to go into that right now, but the question was pretty much the same. Do you love me? And yes, Jesus was making a, a, a very solid point to Peter, and I'm not going to go into that because Peter denied Jesus three times. But I, I, I love the interaction, and, and we're going to talk about after the interaction. He had, Jesus asked Peter, says, do you love me? Peter said, you know everything, Lord. Of course I love you. And Jesus gave him a command. He says, feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? And Peter said, Lord, you know everything. Yes, yes, I, I, I love you. And then Jesus says, find my sheep. And then he asks Peter a third time. He says, do you love me? And, of course, Peter breaks down at that time. He says, yes, Lord, I do. I love you. He said, feed my sheep. And there's a message there. It really is a message. Uh, it, it is a message to the entire church. Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, which means rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church, not the foundation. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3. which says, I'm going I'm to start with you, Peter. We're going to build that church. So the command was given to the ultimate, the, the entire church as it was. But it was very, also very specifically given to Peter. You, will, you have to understand that none of you have the same individual calling. We are all called to different things. As one is called to minister to, to fishermen, some of you may be called to music. I'm not that guy. You know that. You've heard me sing. Some of you in the videos are into children's ministry. We are all called to individual things. But it was the inner, it was, it was what happened after Jesus had this interaction with, with, um, with Peter that is very universal. He looks at Peter, and this is how he began the ministry with these fishermen. He looks at him and he says, but Peter, and this is to every single one of us, you must follow me. That's universal. We must follow Jesus, period. You get anything from this, this, this sermon, get that. Follow Jesus, period. But Peter, much like us, was given, into distra given to distractions. 
In verse 20, John 21, 20, right after Jesus gave him the command to follow me, Peter turned. And he saw that disciple who Jesus loved, this is John, was following them. This is the one that, who had leaned against Jesus at the supper. And he said, and Peter said this, he said, Lord, who's going to portray you? That's the one who said that. When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about that guy? So did, did you did, see if you get this real quick? And I told uh, our cameraman, I'm not moving. Don't worry. Real quick. Jesus in front of him. Jesus said, you must follow me. And as soon as Jesus said that, he turns the other way. There's your distraction. What about that guy? See, there is a right way to judge, if you will. And there definitely is a wrong way to judge. There is a right focus when it comes to judgment, and there is a wrong focus when it comes to judgment. Look at the neighbor right next to you real quick and just tell them, you, I don't hear it, are a distraction to me. Now, some of you, if you're married to each other, that may be in a different way and format. I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> but every single one of us has distractions. We all unfortunately have maybe what is natural, what is sinful, I'll say this, but this uncanny desire to hear the command to follow Jesus, but to immediately turn to somebody else and look at them and say, what about that guy? I have three simple things for you today. You can write them down. If not, I'll give them to you later. <coughs> It is under my main point, it is not your job to judge other people. And I'm going to tell you why. Three reasons. First reason why you should not judge somebody is this. You don't know them. Period. You might think that you know somebody. You might look at them a lot. You may not see them every single day of your life or once a week or once a month. You may even live with the person, but you simply do not know the person. If at best, you know what's on the outside. But God does not judge what is on the outside. God knows what's on the inside that matters. What we do when we look at somebody and we see a particular behavior or an action, we fill in holes that are not there. I wrote an article in the newspaper. I write a lot of articles that come into the newspaper. I publish in different places, different uh, stands. I believe that we are salt on the earth and that we need to be fighting a, a society, a culture that is constantly falling apart. That's why I write these articles. Uh, and I fight and argue in different positions. I like to argue. That's, that's what, find that thing you love to do, arguing, <laughs> and do it a lot. I'm salt. We had a lady in the community, right? Another individual in the community that was friends with me and this friend shared the email minus the person's name. And it started out like this. Well, we all know that Mike Jenkins likes to see his name in print. And then she goes on to totally, um, if you would, belittle me in the community behind my back. She doesn't know me. I don't think that I've ever met her. But she is able to see me from afar, because I'm a public figure, and be able to dissect me and tell you the method or the, the, the motive behind what I do. The 
But do we do this? Why does the businessman work so hard? Because he loves money. You put that there. Does he love money? Does she love money? Maybe. Maybe not. I was behind a woman uh, the other day at, I think it was Neiman Market. She had food stamps. Actually, it was like a, some sort, I think it was WIC, because WIC, you get the little certificates, I think. I, well, we were on WIC, and it was pulling out the WIC and everything, so the milk was free, and the cheese is free, and, and the juice, the juicy juice is free. And I was behind the person, and, and I am somewhat of an impatient person, but there was a person between me and this person who was even much more impatient with this person, saying things under their breath. I hate these lazy people getting things for free. Is she lazy? No, she put that there. She might be. And then the woman bought cigarettes. Oh, no. Not only is she lazy, but she's evil incarnate. Is she? Might be. She might be addicted. I don't know. It's a really hard thing to, to kick. What about the sinner that you see every single day? Name a sin. How about being judgmental? We have this, we have this tendency to generalize people. We see them. They act in a certain way, and we label them. They are bad. They are evil. They are disgusting. They are the spawn of Satan himself. Beelzebub. We never take into consideration the daily temptations they may face. We have no idea if they're crying at night that they hate the person that they are. And we have no idea if they feel so disgusted every time a Christian looks at them with judgmental eyes because they too are being sinful. You put it there. You're filling in a hole that doesn't exist, that may not exist, that most likely doesn't exist. Like a magnifying glass, a laser beam, you scorch them. The Bible says a love covers a multitude of sins. Do you know what that means? Kyle and Andrew, believe it or not, are not the most moral children in the world. They do things that are wrong. And sometimes they do things that are wrong that I could just throw my hands up in the air and say, I give up, God, they're yours. Well, I do that anyway. They're not mine. But it amazes me that I could look at their behavior, I could look at my wife's behavior, I could look at Gabriel and Connor's behavior and Isabella's behavior, and no matter what they do in life, I mean, I could get snapped at, they could do something stupid, and it's like I have an excuse for them. You know, maybe they're tired. Could they be a jerk? Absolutely, could be a jerk. But I seem to overlook it some, somehow, some way, sometimes. Why? Because I love them. And the Bible's true. Love covers a multitude of sins. When you were first dating your spouse or, your, your, or the person that you're with now, man, they was perfect. And as you got to know them, like, oh, what happened? No. <laughs> a love covers a multitude of sin. Can I ask you, what does the opposite do? The further away you get from love, what does it do? It magnifies behavior. And then no matter what they do, it must be wrong. The way they breathe, it just takes me off. <laughs> like a monkey. Stop it! Can I ask you, 
especially if you're somebody who constantly sees the bad and the evil in someone, and all you see is the wrong and the wrong and the wrong and the wrong. And Jesus said, a new command I have given you, you must love one another as I have loved you. Who is it that has the heart that is wrong? It is you. You're judging them. And you don't even know them. So that's my first point. You don't know them. Second is this. You can't change them. Oh, I suppose you could try. You could do your very best. I mean, in, in homes, there are wives that marry. They come up, they, 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 they seek counseling, and then, they, oh, he's, yes, he has his problems. Yes, he has his issues. Yes, he may not be a believer. She may not be a believer. But don't worry. Over time, I will change them. <laughs> you will not. In churches, people come in. They, they look a certain way. They act a certain way. Don't worry. We will change them. No, you will not. In friendships, I will change them. Here's what you'll do. Here's what you'll do. You only see the outside. Did you know that? I've already said that, correct? At the very best, the only thing you can do is change the outside. Churches do it all the time. They come in. The person's not dressed a certain way. They are ostracized. They are looked at differently. They are made to, to, to think and act until eventually they, 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 they just look at them and then eventually they just start dressing like everybody else. Happens in relationships. I had one young lady. I was, this was in my financial counseling ministry who was, um, they were, I have to change this in such a way. They were, they had a friend who was also a a, a a business partner of sorts and my counsel to them was you have to break this relation off as soon as possible because you can't afford to be giving them the money because you don't got any money that has to stop and they said I can't do that why because they won't be my friend it was a very 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 neat this person has literally kept you in a monetary bondage because you didn't want to lose a friend. So you can change a person on the outside, but you won't change them on the inside. Do you know what we call people who try to change other people on the outside into an image that they conceive is the right image. Do you know what the, the religious word that we use is? Pharisee. You are whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. And these Pharisees would go all over the entire world, all over the land, looking for people that they could control, that they could make a, 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 a convert of. And Jesus said they made them twice the disciple of hell as they were. Because it is not good enough to be changed on the outside, but be dead on the inside. You can't change what's on the inside. Only Jesus can. That's my testimony. My name is Mike Jenkins, and I have done absolutely nothing. My name's Mike. I'm a sinner. And he changed me. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's my testimony. I didn't do anything. Nobody changed me. He changed me. I am a new creation. I pray that you are a new creation. If you are someone who tries to change people on the outside, you are a Pharisee. I would also add it's absolutely just not logical to do this. Can I ask you something real quick? If you're a jerk and you've got a friend who's a jerk and you spend your whole time trying to change this jerk, and eventually they do change and they become a nice person, what are you? You're still a jerk. You can't change him, but there are things that you can do 
in your own life that can bring about the change. If you abide in him, you will bear much fruit. All right, so what do we have? We have you don't know them, you can't change them. And finally, John 21, 22. Jesus responds to Peter. Remember, Peter asked him, what about this guy? Peter says, if I want him, he's referring to John, to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. You don't know. You can't change them. They are not your servant. If you're married to a Christian, they are not your servant. You have children that are Christian, they ain't your servants. You have friends that are Christians, they are not your servants. We don't have any servants. They all belong to Jesus. See, you didn't die for them. You didn't create them. You surely didn't go to the cross for them. You surely didn't pay for their sins. You don't own them. Maybe you just don't trust Jesus with him. Who changes people? Did he, he, he said he would, right? Maybe Jesus isn't acting fast enough for you. I don't know. It's one of the hardest things to do, but it is one of the most freeing things to do with my children, with my congregation, with my friends, with my family, with my spouse. As I understand 100% that they belong to another. I understand that if they go off in the wrong, the wrong direction, Jesus will take care of them. He said he would. I trust him in this. They don't belong to me. And quite frankly, and I want you to get this, maybe one day, one day, you brother and sister, maybe it's already happened, maybe one day God will call you to behave, to act in a certain way that you are involved with removing the speck in their eye, but that generally, and it only happens after when? You have first taken the plank out of your own eye. Galatians 6, 1 says, those who are spiritual should be involved in this. And it is far from a spiritual person who is judgmental. Because that work that is needed to help a brother and sister get out of the sin that they are in takes understanding. It takes love. It takes a desire to see them succeed and not a secret desire to see them fall so that you can boast your, about your own abilities. I pray that all of you become this person. But this person is not a judgmental person because they understand that the servant that they are serving does not belong to them, but that he belongs to someone else. Let me close. A magnifying glass, the spiritual magnifying glass, if you will, is best used when it is not pointed at other people. But it is best used when it is used in conjunction with a mirror. For if you truly want to see other people become the person, of, the person of God that God wants them to be. You can only help bring that about by first becoming the person that God wants you to be. You must, you must follow him.
period. Let's pray. You are our God. You created us. You created us. You spoke us in. You spoke everything into existence. You said about the stars. You said, you said the stars exist, and they did. Not with us. You came down, you got on your hands and knees, you probably spit in the ground, and you formed us with your own hands. You know, every intricate part of our body, it says that you knit us in the womb. Out of all creation, you gave us the ability to tell you no. And it broke your heart when we told you no. But you loved us so much that you came down. You relinquished your glory of the heavens. You relinquished everything that you had and you came down. The Son of God came down in the form of a man to serve the godless sinners, the disgusting, muddy, perverted sinners. By sacrificing his life for them. That's who you are. That's not us. Father, give us the heart for those who are lost. Give us the heart for those who are struggling. Give us love for those who are far, far away. Take away our magnifying glasses in that regard. Let us not be their judge. Let us be their brother. Let us be their sister. Let us have a heart for those who hurt. It is in the name of the Most High God that we pray. Amen.